Welcome to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Happy Monday, everybody. Hope you're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Neil, how is everything going? All is good. All is good. I think this is the quietest week we've had in the uh, crypto land in a long, long time. I think this time last week, I was uh, sleep-deprived because I was following the Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash Silver War. But uh, it's been kind of quiet in the last week, so it's kind of weird. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, by this time, uh, from this time last week, rather, I was expecting Bitcoin Cash to have completely usurped Bitcoin as the, <laughs> the new $10,000 a coin uh, currency, but uh, it doesn't seem to have happened. We seem to be back into sort of stable waters. Um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there would be more developments because um, we, we see it on Twitter and the forums, Bitcoin Cash are making a lot of effort to try and boost their profile and develop a community and develop a lot of gathering. And you see a lot of mud flinging on both sides from Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin people and Bitcoin people to Bitcoin Cash people. And I'm sure it's going to be an evolving story. Um, and there's a lot of... Um, uh, unique narratives being developed. For example, one has a low low transaction fees, and then the other has uh, the other one is too high, and the one is too too slow. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin are like, oh wait, we're just doing very low transaction fees all of a sudden. And you just realize that just like messed up all of the assumptions we all had about Bitcoin Cash and how it was going to take on Bitcoin. So it's it's an evolving story, and it keeps it keeps changing. Um, the stories keep changing as to why is one better than the other. But I think in 2018, the story will mature and it will become a lot more evident what's really going to happen. Mm. Yeah, well, I think it's a good opportunity for us to uh, to take some time and talk about some uh, other developments in the cryptoverse because, you know, the... Uh, the Bitcoin story is it's almost like a black hole. Once it starts heating up, you know, you, you can't really look away from it. Uh, and so now it's kind of nice to have sort of a break from it so we can see, OK, what's everyone else doing? Exactly. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it um, I used to Google blockchain and see what the latest news is. And now I just Google Bitcoin because <laughs> it has just become this, uh, as you say, black hole and I think we'll, we will talk more about Bitcoin in the coming weeks, especially because of the CME futures contracts that will be made available, I believe, in December. And um, so we'll, we'll follow that story closely because I think that's going to be the next big event that's going to hit uh, the crypto land. I, I haven't followed that at all. Could you give me the rundown, uh, Neil? Like, to be honest, I, this, is, <laughs> this is kind of the first I've heard of it. Well, um, on, on a high level, I don't want to go into too much detail yet, and we'll do an episode on it. But the high level sure. is that it'd be the first opportunity for institutional investors to really bet on Bitcoin using futures oh. contracts. And one issue with Bitcoin um, on its own as a crypto is that it's very hard to short the best way to short really is you buy when it's low and then you sell when it's high. You know, that's the, that's that's it, that's all it really. Or you could buy Bitcoin cash. But for institutional investors um, and bigger players, they would like to um, short it, like they would short a stock and make money from it going down as opposed to having to buy low. And so this could really change the dynamics it has been seen as potentially one of the main reasons why Bitcoin has been climbing up so much so quickly. Every time it drops, say, 30% or 40%, it seems to recover very, very quickly every single time. And it may be because of this anticipation of the CME and ins institutional money that's coming in. So we'll, we'll look more into it in the future, but I think this will be the next big thing that will hit uh, crypto land. No, it does make sense. I mean, we've we've been waiting since the the inception of this podcast for the big institutional guys to uh, start plonking down the big money into uh, into Bitcoin, into blockchain, other altcoins, and uh, yeah, I I think that that's going to be a big turning point, and we've just sort of been waiting to see sort of 
how it's going to be. So, yeah, we'll uh, do some research into that and uh, bring a bring a full episode when the time is right. Question. Uh, oh, sorry. One other thing I wanted to bring up before we uh, get into just talking about uh, recent developments. Um, one of my friends, after our episode on Friday, mentioned that he knows somebody who actually has a horse. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, if you weren't with us last uh, last Friday, we were talking about the idea of uh, of, do, of tokenizing a racehorse. And that is really the beauty, beauty of tokens, is that you can pretty much tokenize anything, just divide up ownership or, uh, or certain rights into about a million different parts and sell it on an exchange. And uh, so uh, who knows, maybe I'll uh, get in contact with this guy and make, <laughs> make horse coin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think as... Great potential. All you would need is maybe smart contracts that would distribute the winnings of every race to all the different um, token holders. And uh, boom, you have a great business model for a horse. I think it has uh, great potential. Like if I wanted to buy a horse I know in Ireland, I would need to maybe get in, into a syndicate and maybe I'm given like a thousand euro to be part of something. It's more the novelty. But if you really want to get into it in a big way and you're really starting with little equity, I think a horse kind work could be a great way to start. You buy a few few tokens and then, you know, when you make some money, you buy more and you buy more. Next thing you know, you have like 50% of a horse and uh, they're winning big events and you're making lots of money. So, uh, yeah, I think it has yeah. a great potential. You know, you know, you don't even need smart contracts because in the in the end, the there does need to be trust of the institution. You know, you have to trust the guy that owns the horse, whether or not there's a smart contract or it's sort of on a uh, on an honor system, either way, or just with like a notarized document. You could probably just tokenize it on waves. You know? Yeah, I think if you wanted to um, uh, look at a, a in a MVP way, minimal viable product. Yeah, you could do that. Or, but if you think of the bigger picture, like where where could it really get to? What's the the ideal situation? And I think it would be that when you go to a horse racing event, all cash, all winnings are distributed via the blockchain. And, that would be brilliant. And that would mean, and it'd be the case for nearly every single winning event. Or like it could be a thing that, okay, the event has just happened and then they have to like weigh the jockey, do a few checkups. And every time, something is checked and, uh, and the box is ticked, uh, it goes on the blockchain and it could be like, okay, these 10 requirements were met, therefore distribute the earnings by smart contracts. And then that will go on to the different exchanges that are connected to the horses and then you know distribute it to the various owners of the horse. So yeah, like I think that's the ideal situation, but you're right, if you want to do an MVP on it, just do on waves and see where it takes you. Yeah, you know, if you had the smart contract, you could probably uh, disrupt the entire bookie system. Like, you know, oh, yeah, exactly. Entirely, <laughs> just everyone makes their their uh, their bets on the blockchain. All right, we should probably move on. <laughs> this horse horse coin part two here. You know, six hours of horse coin. We'll just change our name to the Horse Coin Podcast. Um. Did you notice, uh, you remember back a while ago when we were talking about Canada was uh, making their own blockchain structure? Yeah, go on. Well, I was reading in Bloomberg today that uh, that uh, in Canada they're working on a system use a, in cooperation with IBM to give Canadians digital IDs. So what this would allow is for uh, Canadians to... Uh, to have sort of a tokenized control of their ID to go from uh, to go to their official government institutions, uh, you know, sort of like Estonia has done, um, sort of like a tiered uh, ID card. Isn't that crazy? It is. It is. Um, the idea has been circulating around the whole idea, like whole concept of having your your ID on the blockchain, and it would be very useful for things like getting a mortgage because your whole credit history will be there and it could mean that everything is done online uh, that you're applying for a mortgage you does not need to meet anyone and if and since all your data is out there in the blockchain uh, it can determine if you're 
a fit for a mortgage and through smart contracts you would get what's required to purchase a house for example the thing is do people want to have all of their history on the blockchain because with a blockchain it's very difficult to hack for example and would people be comfortable you know ha- living in this almost like big brother world where the information is there and cannot be taken away and to what extent is our id on the blockchain and so i think I think there is potential for it, but then there's also the ethical issues that come with it. And, you know, either we would need to have more technological development to occur to design systems that people are comfortable with in order to uh, give up their ID to the blockchain, or, or maybe people will never be comfortable with it. A bit like flying in a plane. Uh, theoretically, a plane, uh, an airplane can take off and land itself, but, you know, I wouldn't go on an airplane with no pilot at the at the wheel you know just for my own personal mental uh safety and security (laughs) i would like to know there's a guy there you know watching the buttons and you know watching the graphs and making sure everything is safe so you know like will people be happy to do that that i think that's the big question you know i've been thinking a lot about this because there are so many different ways you could structure uh, a blockchain ID system, some of them where the the data is in the hands of uh, the government. Uh, most people try to do it so that the data is in the hands of the user only, and, um, and there are ways of doing that. But I think the biggest issue is the fact that the average user doesn't know the difference, right? So, I mean, if, if you had a new blockchain ID system, and the you know you, you, and your mom signed up <laughs> and had her her data on the blockchain and then she could go to the bank get a mortgage go to uh, the hospital and uh, you know uh, and sign up for uh, for x-rays or whatever um do would she know the difference between something where the data was in her hands and unaccessible from anyone else or a, or a system where where the data was completely public to uh, uh, to the government or to someone else, um, and, and how how would the average person tell the difference? And I think it's a big deal because even if you have a secure system, you're going to have these concerns like that. You know, you're like in the end, these systems have to not just work, but they have to be sold to to the public. People have to use them. People have to trust them. And it is hard to get public confidence behind a system to trust a system when they don't understand it. And when anyone can come in and, uh, and say misinformation like, oh, uh, uh, organized crime is going to get access uh, to, your, uh, to your ID or they can hack it or whatever. You see, the, the thing about blockchain as an ID system, the big advantage is that you cannot change what's written on the block um but when it comes to id i think the biggest fear is people accessing the information having it not changing you know that that people don't worry about being changed and so i think we'll still end up having the same problems that we experience today that just because it's on the blockchain doesn't mean someone can hack into the system and just download you know names date of births you know where they live uh, and all these other important pieces of information. Because as long as you have human beings uh, interacting with the system, like you have developers and stuff like this, it just takes one bad guy to to want to hack into the system and download all the information and then sell it on the black market for his own use. So I think that with ID, it um, it depends what trust issue you're trying to resolve if you want to put ID on the blockchain. So I don't know if you can think of any examples of where people don't trust the government in terms of holding their information. I think the biggest advantage with ID on the blockchain would be the use of smart contracts to trigger actions because you know um, one institution mm. trusts the blockchain information. And because it trusts the blockchain information, it's happy to have smart contracts be triggered but but then that would be the reason why we would 
give our ID to a blockchain is to make life easier, like to reduce friction in getting a mortgage or being approved for something, or maybe going for a job and then they would check this blockchain and say, okay, you know what, uh, according to these details on the blockchain, you know, all, all is good because we trust this blockchain, this ID information that it has. Um, and again, you know, do, do people want that? Are, are people going to be happy with that? And I, But in saying that, when we look at social media, the idea that we would give up our private uh, world and, um, and experiences and to think that we would just let everyone know about it, like this is probably something we never conceived back in uh back in the early days of the internet but because of social media now everyone just tells everything everything every, everyone tells everyone everything about what they're doing and they want to show images about it and god knows how many of us have drunken pictures out there of moments we'd rather forget about and yet for some reason we're, we're very comfortable with this and maybe over time people will become comfortable with the idea uh with their information on the blockchain uh, and that uh, it's it's permanent and cannot be taken away. But the trade-off is that it could make their lives much easier when, say, opening up a bank account. And you know, think of all the people out there who are in underdeveloped countries, and it's very hard for them to open up a bank account. Well, maybe a blockchain system with ID and details could ease that and make it much easier to boost commerce in developing mm. nations. No, absolutely. I mean. I mean, it's an important point that everyone is in the cryptoverse is looking for smart contracts to be sort of the, the, the generation to blockchain solutions, you know, smart contracts for land sales, for um, uh, for all uh, for all sorts of uh, potential middleman elimination. But in order to do any of that, you need reliable ID, and the reliable ID has to exist in a blockchain context so that, I mean, uh, otherwise uh, you have to go through an off-chain process, which eliminates all the benefits of having a smart contract in the first place. So, I mean, it does, it does make sense that this is sort of a danger on the right road. Now, you know, from what I understand, you know, looking at some existing... Uh, existing ID and data solutions out there. Um, the way they tend to secure it is is through obfuscation, obfuscation a little bit. Now, I, I, I'm not an expert in all of the different methods, but the way I understand it, like I, when I was reading up on medical records, for example, how you would secure that, the idea is to have like a giant pool of information so that you can see that there are there exist, you know, people who have cancer or people with this birth date or whatever, but it's not in any sort of order. So there's no way to tell whose records go with what, unless you have a private key. And a private key would show you all of the addresses of information that are relevant to you. And that way it can be put together, but it can only be put together by the person who owns the key. So in this case, the danger is less about someone getting access to your data and more about what happens if you lose your key, no one can get it back for you. And that would be an issue, uh, especially with, uh, it, it would be sort of the opposite of the Equifax hack, you know, like when you, when, you know, everyone has their data pooled together, there's a danger of someone collecting it all and then, uh, you know, abusing it. Well, now it's sort of the opposite that, you know, people can collect it all, they can't make any use of it, but the bigger danger is that you lose your own access to it and then no one can get it back for you. And it's one of these issues that comes up with a, with this effort to go into a trustless world. Um, and uh, which is like, honestly, a, a good portion of what people imagine for the future of blockchain. We want to get into a world where we don't have to trust anybody. It's uh, all written into the code. And so, uh, all of the incentives are aligned, and so we know things will move forward and be proper because we don't have to trust an institution. And the danger of that is that no one is able to trust anyone, and so we're on our own if uh, if things go wrong. Yeah, I'm inclined to think that it, a lot of the developing nations of the world 
really have a big opportunity by developing something like this. Because given that a lot of the developed nations already have a lot of um, systems built up and to replace uh, existing data infrastructures is, is such a big task that I doubt many governments and institutions would want to invest in blockchain short term because they already have something. It's like, okay, where, where is the benefit? Like, if we were to invest, like, say, five hundred million dollars into this new blockchain system, how long until we get our ROI? Whereas, because we already have something that's functioning to a certain extent. Whereas, I think that a lot of developed developing nations. Uh, would really it could really buy into this and I, I do, can't imagine that um, the cost would be as significant because they would just need to start off with something very simple they don't need to replicate some crazy big huge database system that's already existing that that serves all needs they can start small and then add on different features while they while they evolve because I think a lot of the trust issues um, are, are quite a big deal for developing nations. Like we're very lucky to come from, uh, you know, the Western world where everything is already developed, and there's a lot more trust in governmental institutions uh, from where we come from than compared to many of the people that are actually out there. And if you look at what's happening in Zimbabwe, <laughs> you have uh, <laughs> is issues with Robert Mugabe, and he's been removed as the head. Um, of his political party, but yet won't stand down as president. And it, there's a lot of difficulties happening there. And, you know, w w it's hard for us to fathom what it's like to be a citizen of that country when you know, we read about it. But, you know, I doubt there's much trust happening in anything. And should, should uh, there be a form of revolution there, a great place for them to start, I know it's easy for me to say this, is to, you know, implement blockchain systems and solutions like we're uh, we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of development in terms of ethereum and other blockchains like it and um, i think it'd be a great place for many potentially non-profit institutions to start uh, developing their uh, database infrastructures using blockchain and i think then we, we we can really see the benefits like when i think of say um, the world we have with the uh, smartphones and how we send money to each other no problem, uh, and seamlessly through through PayPal. I think it was in the Philippines, they were texting each other money before we had smartphones. They were, were way ahead of the game in how they would send money. And a lot of people had bank accounts effectively on their phone. So in the Western world, you know, this idea was kind of crazy, but for, for Philippines, they needed these solutions because it's quite hard to open up a bank account and so therefore the technology and transfer of funds was highly developed in the Philippines and then the rest of the world learned from them and I think that if a place like Zimbabwe was to take on say ID blockchain solutions uh, to help rebuild their government I think the world could then look upon Zimbabwe as a form of a tech leader and I think these are the real big opportunities uh, with blockchain for many developing nations who feel they need to catch up with a lot of Western mm. states. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's funny how the benefits and the dangers are sort of like two different sides of the same coin, right? You know, like in places where there is rampant corruption, that's sort of the benefit of blockchain solutions like for land ownership or, or property ownership or even, even money and payment systems because if you can't trust the institutions of the local country at very least you have some sort of immutable record you can always point back to and say well you know we, you moved the, the land marker you've uh, changed my id you've changed the name things have been stolen from me i can still point to that and say well this is actually the truth on the downside if everyone can see sort of the history and they see uh, see your id and see who you are and that's immutable, then you can't get away from your past or your history if <clears throat> someone wants to uh, uh, persecute you for political reasons. So it's, uh, they're dangers, but I think they're dangers on the right road. And it's, uh, it just shakes things up, makes it hard to predict the future for these sort of things. For sure. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming out today, Neil. I know that you're a bit tired today. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, held held in strong. Uh, now let's uh, ask our listeners. Uh, I mean, what do you think? Would you feel comfortable putting your ID, uh, like having a blockchain ID that would be that would be tied to you? What concerns would you have? It's an interesting question, and uh, if you want to answer it, go to www.analysisinchains.com, join our Slack group, and uh, we can have a conversation on there. As always, if you join our Slack, I'll uh, send you some Neil and Nathan nutshells, our very own cryptocurrency, uh, for as a thank you for joining. One last thing, because we've been talking about uh, immutability of data and data on the blockchain, be sure to tune in on Friday. We've got uh, an interview with the CEO of Data Wallet. And uh, so we talk about a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues, as well as uh, the issues of personal data and uh, and how they are addressing it. So that'll be fun. Anything else, Neil? Before we wrap up, I'm good. I think I'm going to go get myself a cup of coffee. All right, everyone, have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. That's our show. Thanks for tuning in to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Check us out at analysisandchains.com on iTunes, Podbean, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Until next time, keep hashing.